Eine kritische Edition ist eine wissenschaftliche Ausgabe eines Werks, das in mehreren Versionen vorliegt und in der alle verfügbaren Versionen miteinander verglichen werden. Im nächsten Video geht es um kritische Editionen im Kontext der digitalen Geisteswissenschaften. Digitale kritische Editionen bringen sehr viele Vorteile mit sich. Unter anderem gibt es die Möglichkeit unbegrenzter Kommentare, verlinkbarer Querverweise, vollständig durchsuchbarer Texte sowie interaktiver Tools und Visualisierungen. Tara Andrews geht im Video auch auf den Begriff der Kollation ein, der sich auf den genauen Abgleich von Textversionen hinsichtlich ihrer Vollständigkeit und Richtigkeit bezieht. Softwarelösungen haben hierfür gänzlich neue Möglichkeiten geschaffen. Welche das sind und welche Herausforderungen sich dabei stellen, das wird uns Tara Andrews nun erklären. A lot of my own research today has had to do with something called critical editions. What is a critical edition, you might ask? You may have encountered them in history or literature classes. You see, it often happens that some work by an author exists in more than one version. This might be a medieval author whose work was copied by hand many times over centuries in a lot of manuscripts, or a modern author who went through several rounds of draft revision or republication during their lifetime. If the work is ancient or famous or both, it often happens that a scholar will edit that work. That means that the scholar will compare all the available copies and try to establish as far as possible what the definitive version of the text should be. For the ancient or medieval author, this usually means what was the original. For the modern author, this usually means how did the text evolve into the final version that the author meant it to be? When we take these critical editions and make them digital, a bunch of things become possible. You can have unlimited commentary, lots and lots of context and explanation for things, no longer squeezed into tiny footnotes. You can have linkable cross-references to other things on the internet. You get fully searchable text for free. If you get the right permissions, you can include images of the original documents, maybe even linked directly to a transcription, which might help people learn to read the script. And as long as you don't put up a paywall, you have a very wide distribution. Anyone can find your edition. You can make more or less any interactive tool or visualization you can imagine, as long as you know the right amount of JavaScript code for your, for your browser. So this transition to electronic editions, as they were called at the time, was one of the early successes of digital humanities. These editions encompass all sorts of texts. You can have medieval classical texts like the Chronicle of Foissart for French history or the Canterbury Tales. You can have texts that were published in the modern era that are considered classics, for example, the works of Charles Dickens or Samuel Beckett. You can also have collections of unpublished texts that are interesting for historians, for example, all of the letters of Vincent van Gogh. But digital humanities isn't just about putting things online or even about making them online and searchable. Back in the beginning, as we heard in the first video, it was about automating drudge work, such as counting how many times different words appeared in a document. And there is a lot of drudge work that goes into making a critical edition the old-fashioned way. Most of this drudge work is called collation. You see, when a text exists in multiple versions and you want to edit it, you have to reconcile all of these versions and give your scholarly opinion of how the text ought to read. This is particularly interesting for texts that were copied by scribes before the introduction of print, especially since the original is usually long since lost, and in a lot of cases, the original is what most historians are after. There is a well-established process for how to do this, whose roots go all the way back to Byzantine and Renaissance times. The steps are these. One, collect and examine the manuscripts. Pick one that is best based on some criteria, for example, age or completeness or even leg legibility. This is called the base text. Two, collate all other manuscripts against the one you picked. Wherever the texts differ from each other, we call this a variant reading. Three, identify the variant readings that are errors, which is to say, those readings which according to your scholarly judgment could not have been in the original text. Based on this, work in stages to reconstruct the text as closely as you can to the original. As you can see, when done in the traditional way, this is an extremely slow, 
tedious, and detail-oriented process. But you might also have noticed that it's a pretty judgmental process. The first step to uncovering the original is to decide what wasn't in the original, even before you know what the original was. We'll come back to this. In 1989, a scholar named Peter Robinson began a paper with this observation. The collation of manuscripts requires the infuriating accuracy of a pedant and the obsessive stamina of an idiot. It is therefore an ideal task for a computer. Well, we can't argue with that. Programs to find the differences between two computer files had existed since the early 1970s. They were first used in the humanities not long after. This was another fine example of computers helping scholars to automate repetitive tasks and make our work more efficient. But Peter Robinson was also possibly the first to realize this wasn't good enough. Did it make sense to always have a base text? What if none of our texts are particularly ancient or particularly error-free, whatever that means? So his software was the first collation program that did away with the need for a base text by comparing every single manuscript against every single other manuscript in parallel. This was a great example of how a computer could take a traditional task in a direction that simply wouldn't have been practical or even conceivable before. His software was called Collate. It was released in 1994 for Mac OS. This was fine for a while, but then text encoding standards evolved and Unicode came into use and Mac OS died. As a result, Collate was no longer usable after 2003 or so. Nevertheless, the genie was out of the bottle. We couldn't really go back to the old way of collation since we were now far too aware that the base text is more often than not a theoretical hindrance to critical text, even though it had been a practical convenience for hundreds of years. This was a fine example of how digital methods laid bare a methodological problem in our traditional approach and forced us to take more accountability for our scholarly work. Thankfully for us all, text collation software started to make a comeback around 2010, and there are now a few workable options out there again, each of which has its own advantages and drawbacks. But the story doesn't end here. When text is fully digital and collated and sorted out as we need it, we come back to all those judgments that need to be made. For centuries, one of the biggest critiques leveled against scholarly editors of text was that their own prejudices and their own inflated sense of good taste could too easily get in the way of the facts when it came to producing what they considered the best text. In the 19th century, there was a move to counteract this, to put text editing on a more scientific footing with a method called stematics. The idea was fairly straightforward. When you've collated a text, you can use the principle of common error. This is the idea that, broadly speaking, manuscripts that make the same mistake were probably ultimately copied from the same parent manuscript. And you can use these common errors to trace how the different manuscripts diverged from the original over time. With these common errors, you can make a kind of family tree of the manuscripts. This tree is known as a stemma. Once you have a stemma, you can use it, along with your editorial judgment when the stemma doesn't give you an obvious answer, to restore the text at its root. When it works, it works quite well, but there's an obvious pitfall. How do you decide which readings seem to be ancient, i.e. which ones are or aren't errors? This is an important point because, according to the stematic method, manuscripts that share such a true reading, that is, one that was actually original and therefore not an error, they aren't necessarily related. If this method is used without caution, why, the editor could decide that any version of the text that pleased him must have been the original. And then we are right back to where we started. Around the 1970s or so, it was observed that the stemma problem is not so far removed from a similar problem in evolutionary biology. Instead of collating words in a text, the biologists align sequences of DNA, but the goal is similar. They want to try to reconstruct a family tree of organisms or species. Why not try out some of their methods? The results have been promising, but a split grew up between traditionalists and statisticians, as it were. On the one hand, the traditionalists have been accused of letting their prejudices affect their judgment. But on the other hand, the statisticians have been accused of not using any judgment at all. Hmm. 
This dispute was the impetus behind the Tree of Text project of the early 2010s, where I was a postdoc and got my real start in thinking about stemmas as data, and where I began to develop the Stemma Web software package. Our aim was to make an explicit model for text in many versions, so that we could evaluate these different stemmatic methods and see what worked best in which context. While we didn't end up with enough data to answer the original question, yet, what we did produce was a model that has turned out to be useful for doing the editing work and for helping to provide accountability for the decisions and judgments that go into producing the final text. All of these small decisions about what is an error and what is not get recorded. They can be checked for consistency. They can be used to help create stemata. They can be used to compare stemata with each other. And they can even be included in minute detail in a digital publication, which, after all, isn't constrained to text and footnotes. The models and the methods we provide help to shine a spotlight of accountability on how these texts are constructed and what options weren't pursued. And we hope that this will finally put the ghosts of the 19th century critics to rest. <laughs>